guys. We have to make this arrangement so that the podium is too big. Okay, and it's my honor to welcome you all again for this first plenary session of FISITA 2018 on the topic disruptive technologies of, on the topic electric mobility and connected mobility. And it's my honor to welcome the chairperson of this plenary session, Mrs. Rashmi Woodvashri, Director, ARAI Automotive Research Association of India. Let's give a big round of applause. And also, it's my privilege to invite the speakers of this plenary session to the dais, Professor Helmet Ollist, Chairman and CEO of AVL Austria. And Professor Klaus Kompas, Vice President of Vehicle Safety, BMW Group, Germany. Introduce Mrs. Rashmi Woodvashri. She has a distinguished academic career, Masters in Electronics Engineering, Certified Quality Auditor, Certified Six Sigma Black Belt, and Diploma in Corporate Dictatorship from WCCG. Mrs. Udvarshri serves as Chair and Vice Chair of various national bodies, like Chair of Transport Engineering Division Council, F Bureau and Indian Standards. Chair AISC, Automotive Industry Standards Committee, which formulates safety standards in India. She's also Vice Chair of Working Party on Pollution and Energy at the Global Forum under UNECE at Geneva during period 2014 to 2017. She is also the Senior Vice President of SAE India. She also has a co-author of a book on total quality management. She is a recipient of several awards like Women Excellence Award 2015 by Rotary International Pune, Distinguished Alumnus Award of Engineering Excellence Award 2017 by SA India Foundation, and Lifetime Achievement Award from OTSA Trust, and Industry Custodian of the Year 2018 from eMobility Plus. Mrs. Rashmi's other interests are instrumental music, reading, and traveling. With this short note brief, keeping up the time interest, I would like to miss, uh, invite Mr. Rashmi to take the stage. Thank you for introduction, and good afternoon, um, all the delegates and guests here. It's my proud privilege to be here and chair a panel and a session which has two very eminent personalities, and we already, I think, are late by 15, 20 minutes. So uh, without much ado, I would uh, start the session uh, with the permission. And uh, what I plan to do is introduce both the speakers to you uh, one by one. Uh, on my right is uh, Dr. Helmut Liest, who's Professor uh, Liest, is known to all of us, in fact, who are here. Born in 1941, he's a father figure to all of us graduated from Graz University and started working with his own um, company, AVL, has led various research programs. And he's currently the chairman and CEO of AVL List. Under his leadership, the business focus has broadened from the combustion engine to include the whole powertrain encompassing electric drivetrains, hybrids, fuel cell, transmission, software, and batteries. Today, AVL is the world's largest independent company for development, simulation, testing technologies of powertrains for passenger cars, trucks, and large engines, as well as vehicle integration and autonomous driving. Coming to Dr. Least, summary of his achievement is really something which we all should be proud of. His most important priorities in targeted application research, Dr. Least has very wide contribution of fundamental as well as applied research in various areas which I mentioned earlier. Dr. List has been the president, chairman, 
and made it member of numerous scientific research committees, foundations, and also academic research institutes. He has several awards and honors to his credit, and we all know that uh, 2014 FISITA medal was also awarded to him. Uh, with that, I have very great pleasure in welcoming Dr. List and request him to make your presentation um, on the subject, on the theme today. Thank you for the introduction. And, uh, I would like to thank, above all, for the uh, invitation to have the privilege to be speaker here today at this very important conference here in Chennai. And I also very much was impressed by the statements made at the opening ceremony, many true statements uh, that kind of characterize what are the key uh, the ingredients uh, of India in making more and more uh, presence and contribution to the global world in the area of automotive. Uh, one thing uh, I thought this was maybe not mentioned as much as it might have been, India has a strong commitment to science, fundamental science. And I think in order to progress with our plans in the future, we also need a strong scientific basis. Uh, thank you. Uh, we need a strong scientific basis. And uh, uh, I think this uh, can, uh, this is an important fact. The other aspect I very much believe in, I've often experienced it, is the Uh, is the frugal, uh, the attitude of frugal thinking and frugal engineering. This is key. And another key factor is it has, India has the largest number of young people of any nation in the world. So these are three aspects that are also worth looking at uh, and were mentioned, of course. So, with this, I would like to thank again for being able to be part of this conference. And as was said in the past, in one way or the other, the automotive industry is currently undergoing the most significant and pioneering change in history. Shared mobility and autonomous driving create new mobility scenarios and business models. Through autonomous driving and shared mobility, completely new mobility concepts uh, are emerging and will further emerge. Several OEMs have started on their transformation from a pure manufacturer of vehicles to a provider of mobility. Increasing pressure on CO2 fleet targets and the pollutant emission problem in metropolitan areas have resulted in a constant political debate, at least in Europe. City restrictions for internal combustion engines vehicles are on the table. Today, the CO2 emission is assessed only looking at the vehicle. This is too narrow. However, we are expecting in the future a more holistic view where the entire emissions from well to wheel and the complete life cycle emission from cradle to grave is considered. These significant CO2 and emission reductions uh, also impact pose both the production cost of vehicles and the necessary investment, the infrastructure for electric vehicles. What we see here is the picture of a race. You could call it a competition, a co a competition uh, between different uh, technologies. And which will be the best one? First of all, we are talking competition between three 
technologies, the internal combustion engine, the battery electric vehicle, and the fuel cell electric vehicle, which has gained a lot of momentum just in the last 12 months when it comes to attention to its potential. Every technology has benefits, but also faces hurdles. Cost robustness and usability are significant hurdles for the new technologies. Hybrid solutions will help the electrification technology to scale up and get further industrialized and vice versa. Electrification will also help the internal combustion engine technology to further comply with legislation targets. So it's these three areas or ways forward of propulsion and its combinations. The combinations are key. Regarding the combustion engine, the challenge lies not only, at least in Europe, in the technology aspects itself, but also in the public perception. It is necessary to lower the combustion engine's emissions to a no longer environmentally relevant level. Zero impact emissions means that emissions are so low that they have no relevant impact on air quality. With the new legislation, European legislation of Euro 6D temp, uh, including uh, real driving emission, a decisive step has already been taking place in this direction. It can be assumed that such vehicles uh, which are produced as of today, uh, as of beginning of September in Europe, uh, will certainly enable uh, the compliance with the emission limits in today's critical zones of cities. In the case of battery electric power drains, however, the main challenge lies in the cost and production aspects of the energy storage system. A considerable part of the value chain will be within the cell manufacturing and also the risk of a dependency on raw materials uh, that will, is, to, is problematic today and we have to overcome it. In addition, infrastructure, real driving ranges Battery weight are challenges. The strength of the hydrogen-based PEM fuel cell is besides high efficiency, the fast refueling, high energy density of the storage, and thus its long-range autonomy. For fuel cell electric vehicles, a completely new, expensive, and complex infrastructure is necessary, but it is feasible to do it. The competition of technologies and the combination of these technologies at the same time uh, our prediction for market share and technology trends until 2030 clearly shows a decrease of conventional ICE technology and a strong shift towards mild hybrid, plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles. Also fuel cell electric vehicles will increase to a significant number with what we see a large variety of complex electrified solutions in many technology combinations and new technologies with fuel cell electric vehicles. In addition, major technology trends such as automated driving and connectivity are being developed and will also support e-mobility with smart connection to charging infrastructure and predicting operating strategies will lead to new and disruptive solutions and exciting engineering challenges. With this huge variety and complexity, it is essential task for us as engineers to master the bandwidth of technologies and to understand their combination and most meaningful application. 
with that understanding, we will turn challenges into opportunities and create products that will enable vehicle concepts with very flexible integration solution, lower center of gravity, and excellent driving behavior, and state-of-the-art electric axles with highly integrated uh, e-machine, power electronics, and gear set. The complexity can be characterized by three major drivers. Number of variants, system complexity, and environmental and infrastructure dependency. To make these challenges, we see three industry trends. Increase the effectiveness of the development process with methodology and simulation. In that case, manage, be able to manage uh, complexity in a positive way. Decompose complexity by applying modularity and tackle the challenges together also with many more partnerships we are going to see in the future in the industry. The conventional vehicle the conventional vehicle development process is more and more influenced by the ability to model uh, physics and to assess solutions in virtual environments and to do more and more engineering in, vir in a virtual environment. Already in a very early stage, key decisions on consumer-relevant product attributes need to be fully understood to define and develop the right solutions effectively. This means that all aspects of what people also in a subjective way can feel and experience when driving a vehicle or being driven automatically uh, will become more and more key and we have to learn to integrate this into the development process and into the final solution when it comes to the whole software and controls situation. An integrated and open development platform supports the development process to become more agile and by that increase the efficiency in every development step. This helps to decompose complexity and to focus in, on the key tasks. The consequence of accelerating of the accelerating pace of technology is a transformation of the development methodology. What we experience is that the traditional hardware-centric uh, development uh, needs uh, of the past, uh, this need to be balanced with an equal emphasis on mathematical simulation and that way physics and chemistry-based science have this included in the development process. This paradigm shift does not only affect early stages of the development, but the entire process. And it is in particular this, sim this interaction between theory and experiment or simulation and test, which will speed up the process and make it more relevant and also much more precise on its, when it comes to the scientific basis. A key enabler for the success of this methodology is a consistent development environment and a seamlessly connected tool chain. The connection of individual test environments from hardware in the loop to vehicle test beds creates consistency on the validation path and in the overall concept phase to begin with. Sharing test procedures and data between the test environments increase the efficiency. 
the connection to the simulation tool chain in every environment increases the effectiveness. Real hardware is integrated when it becomes available and supports from load, front-loading activities. The fusion of simulation with methodology and test makes it possible to manage the increasingly amount of test cases and the integrated tool chain allow, or tool chains rather, allows to execute those in an automated and effective way. A central piece for the modern system engineering methodology is the multi-integration test environment. This represents a platform for interdisciplinary teams. Seamless interaction of virtual and real components allow validation and calibration tasks which would be only possible in the vehicle on the test track. <clears throat> now, a majority of functional validation and calibration tasks can be done very early in the development process. It does not only make the process more effective, but produces more robust and mature products and lets us achieve much higher levels of optimization. It is an indispensable tool and enabler allowing to accelerate the pace of innovation. The virtual assessment of driving attributes such as emissions, greenhouse gases, and drivability uh, ensure a consumer-centric project understanding, or product understanding, rather. The efficient collaboration between traditional and new development areas is important to assess the powertrain solution of tomorrow. The variety of solutions for future mobility is nearly unlimited. The modular engine families of today need to be transformed to modular powertrains families for the future, who have a number of technologies in a modular way arranged in an overall system which can really adapt to customer needs. One element uh, of the symbiosis of traditional and new technology is the, module, the modular 48 volt powertrain family. Uh, today, the 48 volt technology is mostly implemented for CO2 reduction and it's not utilizing its full potential. Increasing the power of a 48 volt powertrain from 10 to 15 kilowatt of today to more than 30 kilowatt peak power allows additional great opportunities. It has the potential to significantly reduce emission further, uh, locally zero emission as plug-in hybrid and zero driving emissions as a, as a small battery electric vehicle. This modularity shows the huge variety that can be addressed, which helps to achieve a better affordability. In the last five to seven years, the cost reduction of batteries and improvement in energy density shows the potential uh, of this technology. Especially with new technology like solid state batteries, additional improvements will be achieved. The cons consumers uh, experiences this progress mainly by increasing driving ranges and less in reducing total battery cost at this point in time. Looking into the cost structure of a D-segment electric vehicle, more than 70% of the powertrain cost are still assigned to the battery. Although uh, there are major cost improvements, the battery pack remains the most expensive component. The battery is the great enabler and the great limiting factor. And we have, as engineers, we have to dance around the battery and to make it come affordable in the overall system 
and get as much value out of the battery uh, to achieve full and best drivability and performance. The battery size scales with the desired vehicle range and consequently the cost of the battery increases. As an alternative technology, the fuel cell electric vehicle offers longer distance traveling and faster refueling times, much faster, similar to what we use today. Integration attributes such as overall weight or the scalability of the fuel cell stack enable the usage of larger passenger vehicle uh, and uh, or medium and full size commercial vehicle. That is where the focus will mostly be. Overall, system costs show advantages in those vehicle segments. There is also the potential for further optimization with more industrialization and scaling effects. Uh, this is an area I think we all see more engagement in the future. We at AVL clearly have started over the last 10 years to emphasize a lot on fuel cells, solid fuel cell and solid oxide fuel cell and PEM fuel cells, and we see it uh, as a very important way forward. It's the three propulsion systems which in the entity need to be seen to cover the needs of the future when it comes to propulsion, to vehicle propulsion. The increase in energy density of today's battery cell chemistry will be slowing down in technologies used today. The next technology step is expected to be solid state battery cells, which still will be an, a step forward in the order of probably 30 percent or so, uh, will further improve energy density and also improve battery cell safety and also help cost and robustness. In the area of the area of integration of batteries, there is still a large innovation potential on poten of battery module and pack level, which still can be improved a lot. The battery is and will become even more an in integral part of the vehicle and its thermal system. Low height batteries with optimized cooling concept can further reduce weight and cost better cooling capabilities will support faster charging. In order to make battery electric vehicles marketable, it is truly necessary, it is necessary to implement the available charging infrastructure both in the home and business areas as well as long, along the highways. In the home business areas, charging powers of 11 to 22 kilowatt will dominate and be made even more convenient with inductive systems. Charging stations with charging capacities of 50 to 350 kilowatt DC will be used in fast loading cases along main traffic routes. In the long term, the aim is a fast charging time of 10 minutes for 400 kilometer range. Avial pioneered the uh, 800 volt technology seven years ago in a demonstration vehicle uh, and also, of course, 800 volt is also a better basing for faster changing, for faster charging. However, there are still many open questions about the electrical infrastructure, especially in cities, and the effect of reduced life of the batteries by fast charging. This has not yet been overcome, and some fundamental research will be needed to deal with this. Every technology innovation that is optimal use, 
has its optimal use in a specific application. Markets and their mobility patterns are very diverse and so are the technical solution. The exciting task is now to apply the right solution. A broader view on the total mobility spectrum is necessary. For every OM, it is a core competence to optimize their product portfolio, whether it's through their own development or through cooperation, it will be broader, more complex, but on the other side, much higher levels of efficiency and uh, meeting also the, the question of the importance of sustainability. So it is important to find, define the right electrification level and combination of technology. So, with this, I would like to thank you. I think we have a, overall, there is a, if you look at the three ways forward, the combination, also advanced simulation methodologies and methodology in general, uh, and also the flow of base technology coming from all areas of industry and research that flow into the propulsion systems uh, continuously uh, will make uh, a big difference. We need all these efforts together and combined to be successful, to have a truly affordable and fully sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor List, for a very wonderful presentation. Um, having heard the developments which will change uh, the future for all of us into greener uh, technologies, now it's time to also focus on what is the scenario. And uh, for that, I would like to now invite Professor uh, Dr. Klaus Kompas. Um, who is the Vice President Vehicle Safety at BMW Germany. Um, Dr. Kampas received his Diploma in Safety Engineering from the University of Uppertal in Germany. He joined BMW way back in 1986, almost the same time when I joined ARI. So, um, he was a project leader for various innovative projects including the first of its kind, head protection inside uh, side uh, airbag, which was launched in 1997. Then he moved to Autolift for a short while and back again in 2003 to BMW as a director for electronics engineering and later as a head of advanced driver assistance systems. Since 2008, Professor Compass is Vice President, Vehicle Safety for BMW Group. In his role, he is responsible for all crash test facilities, the development of active and passive safety, as well as accident research. He received the Airbag Award from Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in 2004. Other several awards and recognitions to his credit and he also was honored in 2017 with the Pathfinder Award from the Automotive Safety Council. I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Klaus. Thank you very much, Chairman, Chair Lady, sorry. Um, ladies and gentlemen, connected vehicles, connected mobility, Autonomous mobility, shared mobility, electrified mobility. What is the common ground for all these aspects? What kind of characteristic forms those aspects the most or strongly? And what kind of characteristic is being influenced by all those aspects? And the answer is vehicle safety. Safety is always important, especially uh, in terms of all those new disruptive technologies. And I would like to take you on a journey to the vehicle safety aspects of assisted and automated driving and what we have to consider when we develop assisted driving or automated driving. At first, there's a very interesting number 
Uh, and, the, and the number says that more than 98% of all accidents are caused by human failure, by human error. Um, that can lead us to the conclusion that, well, we simply take all the human beings out of the loop, let technology do the job, and we will have no accidents anymore. And I want you to be very careful about such a sentence. You, we, we hear these sentences or sentences like that quite frequently, but I would like you to be very careful and respectful with what the human being can really do in avoiding accidents. The human being is a fantastic accident avoider. And I would like to, to show you one example. You see this pedestrian crossing in Japan and the people, they run into each other, they cross the street from one side to the other side, and I was told by some Japanese colleagues, nobody gets hurt afterwards. So the, the human being is fantastic in avoiding accidents. Try to imagine, you, 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 will, you will, as an engineer, you get the task to develop robots to do the same. That's quite a challenge. I think you all agree. So, in general, human beings can avoid accidents in a pretty good manner. The human being has a lot of strengths. and We must not forget about the strengths of the human being. We are very capable of mastering highly complex situations. I was just... When you, when you go out of, the, uh, out of the trade center here and you watch the traffic there, this is really complex traffic. And human beings are very well in managing that kind of traffic. Well, probably I wouldn't be so good in managing that, but there are so many peoples out there that really manage the traffic. And uh, we are, as human beings, we are very good in, in mastering highly complex situations. We have a very good intuitive power. We can imagine things that have not taken place yet, but we can anticipate what's coming. We have a very good uh, decision-making process based on experiences, and I will show you an example afterwards. We have a lot of formal communication, but we also use the channel of informal communication, and I will also show you an example for that. Um, we have a nearly perfect object recognition capability. If I look into this crowd of people in front of me, I cannot uh, uh, only identify you as human beings, but I can also identify specifics from you. I can identify whether you watch me now or whether you watch on your smartphone or whatever. So we have very good capabilities in identifying objects and uh, categorizing objects. Nevertheless, we have to admit and we have to acknowledge that there are not only strengths with human beings, we also have some disadvantage aspects, some weaknesses. Um, we like to get distracted. We all know that and driver distraction is one of the biggest issues in traffic today and one of the biggest causes for accidents. We get tired, we get fatigued. We show emotional actions, we act under anger, egoistic, sometimes irrational even. Sometimes we interpret rules individually. And I was wondering whether is this a weakness or a strength? So I put it somewhere in between because the individual interpretation of rules can sometimes ver be very, very beneficial. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it's, it, it's pretty good. The biggest weaknesses, or one of the biggest weaknesses that I see is the sequential task performance. If you have a technical system and you have a car in front of you, you have a car on your left lane, you have a car on the right lane, and suddenly the car in front of you stops braking heavily. A technical system knows, knows right away that there is an, not another car in the left lane, another car in the right lane, so I have to push the brake as hard as possible. The human beings, we do it sequentially. We look at the car in front of us, the car is braking, okay, so maybe I can, I can steer around. So I look into the left, out of the left window, oh, there's another car there. I look at, uh, outside the right window, another car there. I have to brake. That simply costs time. A technical system can do that much faster because it has all those informations instantaneously. So there are strengths and there are weaknesses, and if you look at the strengths and weaknesses from the other point of view, and that is what can a technical system do well and where does a technical system has its weaknesses, you will figure out that it's just the opposite round. 
So the combination of a human being and a technical system seems to be a very good solution. Let's look at the numbers and uh, I was very surprised and, uh, well, not surprised, but uh, very um, uh, disappointed to hear that uh, in India we have something like 150,000 fatalities every year. This, this, is, this is a number is, is simply unacceptable. In Germany, not, uh, um, that is the basis for the numbers that I, that I present here, we have 3,200 and something, 216, I think about 14 um, fatalities in 2016. Still way too many, no doubt about that. But if you look in the, uh, uh, into the total numbers, we have a total number of accidents, 2.6 million per year. 300,000 accidents with injuries, 2,000, more than 2,000 fatalities per year, and so on. And the approximate number of between two accidents is 90,000 kilometers between two accidents of any kind and any severity. Approximately 760,000 kilometers have, uh, uh, um, are between two accidents with injuries and more than 70 million kilometers between two accidents with fatalities. So that is another, another very good argument that if you make this equation 98% of all accidents are caused by human error, you must not forget all those situations where the human being has avoided the accident. And you only look at those numbers where this avoidance didn't take place and didn't occur. Now let, let us look at, at, at three examples. Um, we collected those examples from, uh, from cars that we use as field operation tests. So, so those cars are equipped with cameras. In this case, it's the same driver, so we reconstructed those specific situations. And the first is the anticipation. If you look at the bottom left first, while I run this video, you see it's an urban traffic scenario, and I stop the video right here. What you see there is the driver, if you look at the, uh, if the top uh, uh, to the top left uh, screen, the driver sees and watches the right-hand side. So there is something going on. And what actually is going on is that the driver sees a pedestrian that has already crossed the street. So this pedestrian that has already crossed the street is out of danger. But this pedestrian is an indication that there's another pedestrian crossing the street now, or starts to cross the street right now. As a human being, we already ant can an anticipate that, well, if there are pedestrians, so maybe I take a very close look at this edge there. And actually what happens is, yes, there's a little kid crossing the street. The driver has anticipated that and could react in time. For a technical system, we can start um, we, we can start a reaction when we see something, so we have to wait for this pedestrian to be detected. One big advantage of human beings. Another one is experience. And um, now you see this bottom left again, you see the bus. And um, actually, if you look at the driver now, the driver stares at something, he wants to see something. What does the driver want to see? He wants to see whether there is a bus stop ahead. Because if there is a bus stop, the bus will most probably stop there, and then the bus becomes an obstacle for me, so the next reaction is, and you can see that, the next reaction of the driver, okay, there is a bus stop, now take a look at the left, is the left lane empty, so I can change lanes. For an automated system as we use it today, this automated vehicle will most probably stop behind the bus. So we have the experience, we know if there is a, uh, a bus on my lane, uh, the bus will, will stop some, some time. So I need to swerve around, I need to take, a, early enough I need to take a look whether the left lane is empty. And the next stop in this case, in this video, is where does the driver look at now? The driver looks at the front left edge of the bus because in, if, the, if, the, if something moves in this little triangle there on the front left edge of the bus, the driver doesn't need to have a full pedestrian. The driver knows someone's crossing the street. 
This is based on experience. Try to teach a technical system to look at this, at the, at this little edge for some pixels that we have available on the video that we, that, or the video camera that we use in our cars. That's a pretty difficult task. The human being has the experience. If something moves underneath the, uh, uh, the bus in that, in that edge, uh, uh, most probably a pedestrian will, will cross, so I better start braking. Third example, I talked about formal and informal information or communication. And uh, one example for informal communication is this one. Again, bottom left first. Uh, you see this, this car driving in an urban situation, and the driver wants to turn right. And there is someone showing gestures. I don't know. These are, these are not formal informations. So this is not a formal communication, but we all know, well, this guy doesn't want us to drive into that road. So the driver shrugs his shoulders and turns left again and continues driving. So again, these are just three examples of uh, uh, strengths of human beings, and they are most probably those strengths of the human beings and the weaknesses may be different in different markets. I don't know the strengths and the weaknesses in the Indian market, but you probably have some examples to share um, where the Indian drivers have their, their own strengths that I don't know about. So we have to be, be very careful in just blaming the driver as the accident cause number one. As a summary of the first part, um, the assist, we, we, have to, we have to distribute between assistance and automation. It is very good to assist the driver with technical systems. Is it is a completely different story to just take the driver out of the loop and do it all by a technical system. Number two, we have to consider mixed traffic. There will always be older cars on the roads. There will always be trucks, motorcycles, bicycle drivers, pedestrians on the road that are not connected. So mixed traffic makes it much more difficult. If we forget about the mixed traffic, if, if we forget about all those other participants and would only have automated vehicles on the road, the task would be much easier. But we certainly have the mixed traffic. The total transfer of control shall initially be restricted to less complex and rather transparent traffic scenarios and traffic situations. I mean, it's much easier and it's probably one of, the, one of the, the first steps for automated driving will be on highways, in traffic congestions, on, on uh, um, heavy traffic, on, on autobahns or highways. The driver remains the fallback solution for a long period of time. We're talking about level two now, assisted drive or uh, partially automated driving. The driver remains the fallback solution also, we believe, also for level three and also in some situations for level four. Um, when the driver or as the driver is the fallback solution, we have to consider enough time budget for the transition process. So if we have a car that can drive to some extent auto automatically or autonomously, and the, the car has to pass back the task to the driver, we have to consider enough time for the driver to take over. It is not that one second reaction time. We will certainly need more time, depending on the specific situation. And the primary target is not to replace the driver, but remain a high level of safety, also in automated mode. I think this is a very, very tough task that we have to face. Nevertheless, with all the systems that we include into our vehicles today, even though they are mainly oriented on making driving a little bit more comfortable, um, letting the car do the uh, longitudinal or, or uh, uh, the steering control for, to, to some extent, it is more for my convenience. But with all this, to, in, in order to, to, to allow for those systems, we have to integrate intelligence into the vehicles. We have to have very high sophisticated sensor systems, algorithms that know about the environment of the vehicle to a great extent, and these intelligence, in, 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 intelligence systems can support the driver when the driver drives in an, in, in an assisted mode. So whatever we do for automated driving is good for vehicle safety because in an assisted mode on very, in very complex situations where the driver drives the car, he gets the assistance 
and the support and the help of the uh, intelligence of the technical system. I talked about the levels and for those of you who work in this area, this is a very uh, common chart, you all know about that. For those who are not daily working in assistance or dri driver assistance or uh, automated driving, these are um, six levels, well, five levels plus the level completely manual um, of automated driving. We all have the cars that are on the road today are in level two. Level two is partially automation. So that means for a certain period of time, the car can take over the steering, can take over the longitudinal control, pushing the gas pedal, pushing the brake pedal. But in any case, the driver, the human being, is responsible for what the car does. That changes when we go into level three, because in level three, we allow the driver, level three plus, level three, four, and of course, level five, we allow the driver to do something different, to do something else, and the car will manage the rest. That's a, a, a paradigm shift, um, and that causes a number of prerequisites before we can really bring such a car onto the road. Um, with level, excuse me, go back one more. Um, with the level two system that we have today, with a, uh, um, a five series BMW here, here, or the X5, or the all new 3.5 that was, uh, uh, three series that was just um, uh, announced a couple of days ago, uh, we have the driver assistance systems level on level two in those cars, and you can, you can read all those different features and functions, and they all support vehicle safety as well. They are mainly integrated for comfort reasons, but they all support vehicle safety. And we have a great benefit out of those driver assistance systems even today. If you look at that, we have normalized cars without ADAS, without advanced driver assistance systems to one. And with the help of those driver assistance systems, those, those, those three, just the lane departure warning, the ACC stop and go, and the automatic emergency braking, we have been able to reduce the number of accidents by approximately 30%. And that is a very good uh, statistics. We analyzed 1,000, uh, excuse me, 1 million vehicles. All the BMW vehicles, most of the BMW vehicles are equipped with an intelligent emergency call. So whenever an accident occurred with airbag deployment, this message goes into our back-end computer, we can analyze those accidents. They are anonymous. We don't know who was driving, but we know a lot about the accident itself. And so the analysis of one million accidents showed us, or one, one million vehicles showed us this, these results that already with the driver assistance systems as we have them today, we could significantly reduce the number of accidents. Now, as we go into level three, and again, that's the paradigm shift. The driver can do something different than always watching the car in front of him or the traffic around him or her. Um, with level three, with conditional, or then with level four, with high, auto with high uh, uh, automation, at BMW, we've created a number of, at first we call them golden rules, now we, now we better call them guidelines. 12 guidelines that every vehicle that is brought to the road, whether it's a test vehicle on public roads or, of course, at the end for um, production vehicles. We have to fulfill those 12 guidelines. And I will just show you the top level um, of, of those, of those uh, 12 guidelines, of those rules. Um, of course, there is a lot of more detail behind it. Um, I don't want to go too deep into those, but I, I feel it is very, very important that we create a standardized level of safety that each of those cars need to have. As I said, that, that is relevant for test vehicles on public roads as well as for serious production vehicles. Of course, the solutions will be different. In a test vehicle, I have a well-educated test driver, and in um, serious production cars, I need to have another solution. There's no doubt about that. But the requirements remain the same. Just three examples out of that. Um, safe function and redundancy. We have to deal with degradation. So if ever something happens, if a component that is relevant to that function has a failure, becomes non-available for whatever reason, we have to have a fallback solution. 
As an example, if one of the radar sensors is compromised, other environmental sensors shall compensate, or a handover with adequate time shall be initiated. What adequate time means is being defined, or we are in the process of defining that right now. So again, that an, an great number of details follow after this headline requirement. But as a headline requirement, this is essential, we believe. Vehicle initiated handover. If the vehicle wants to hand the task over to the driver, and, and if the driver does not comply with the takeover request, the automated driving system must perform a maneuver to minimize the risk. What this minimum risk maneuver actually means depends on the situation. If the driver doesn't take over during a free flowing automated highway drive, well, the best thing you can do is the, drive, the, the car pulls over to the shoulder and gets to a safe stop there. If you're in a traffic congestion on the very left lane, you better stay where you are. That is the, safer, the, the safest um, solution. But bring it into a, min a minimum risk condition. If the driver um, uh, takes over, the driver initiated transformation, if the driver wants to take over, we have to, of course, activate or deactivate the automatic uh, uh, driving system with the explicit driver's intent. So we have to clearly identify whether was it just the driver was just touching the steering wheel just coincidentally, or was it on purpose? Was it really done um, uh, on, on purpose because the driver wants to take over? Um, an, an explicit driver takeover always overrules the technical system. That is one of the guidelines that we, that we have defined for us. So again, these are just three examples out of those 12. And the very last one also says passive safety. Uh, we still have to consider the fact that whatever automation level we have, there will be accidents, so there will be remaining accidents. And in those accidents, we have to protect the car occupants to the greatest extent. So we must not reduce the level of passive safety even for highly automated vehicles. The basic idea is that we already, and that is already, that is already done to a great extent. We have the governments, we have the committees that created categories like the SAE level, level one, two, three, four, five. Uh, or the ACSF, um, and then we have requirements, and those requirements will be defined as guidelines, or as rules, or as standards, or in consumer gr uh, groups. Um, so these guidelines should be created, or these requirements should be created by the government or um, con consumer groups and the industry, because we need to bring us as car manufacturer, as suppliers, we need to bring us in into the definition of requirements. And then there are the technical solutions. And on the very left, I wrote industry. Because please, government, leave the innovation power to the engineers at the industry to create the solutions. Create the requirements, no doubt about that, 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 that is necessary, but make those requirements solution independent because we might be able, and we probably will be able, to create solutions that many people have not thought about. And those innov innovation power should be used. So the industry, the manufacturers, the suppliers should be the ones that create the solutions. As a summary, when you develop automated driving, driver assistance systems, consider the human strengths and weaknesses for the development of both assisted and automated driving. Supporting the human being is preferential to replacing him or her. I think that was also clearly stated. Define standards and clear goals, targets, and guidelines for automated driving. If we talk about automated driving, it must not only be a name, I call my car autopilot, or I call my car uh, auto guide, or whatever. Uh, we have to have clear targets and guidelines and requirements. Leave the space for innovations. Please do not standardize solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kompas.
Um, the one takeaway which I really liked was his last line, don't standardize solutions. So thank you very much for wonderful presentation. And uh, as uh, we seem to be behind schedule, uh, it's only time for a couple of questions. Quick questions, I'll open the forum for uh, quick questions. Uh, kindly raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself, and straight away ask the question. Any questions? Doesn't seem to be so. Uh, if not, I have a question uh, for you uh, and both of you, in fact. Uh, with so much of electrification now coming in, is there any specific uh, uh, requirement to work on the safety of EVs, uh, to be precise? As I said, all those four aspects connected, a lot of safety aspects, a lot of safety issues, uh, automated, um, shared, and of course electrified. We have a great number of uh, new requirements based on electric vehicles, whether it's crash tests, uh, whether it's the uh, safety in use, what do, what do people, uh, how do people have to be protected when they handle with electrified vehicles. Uh, we have a great number of, um, of, new, of new requirements and uh, we are still learning. We even go as far as um, defining rescue manuals and rescue um, processes. If an electric vehicle has a, a crash, what do you do with the car afterwards? So the answer, the clear answer is yes, a great number of new requirements. The, the key, of course, is also to make sure we have the uh, capability to have all test cases of real life available, so to speak. E essentially, to find all the real test cases that are relevant for all kinds of situations we can imagine <coughs> is key for a validation process. And that today can be done uh, very well. But the key is to really make sure we have this full spectrum of test cases. How do we do this? So experimental testing here is very important on the one side. On the other side, to capture all these situations and then uh, cover millions of miles driven by, uh, uh, by a faster uh, software process of checking it out uh, is also key. Very right, and my experience in handling this subject at ARA is also the same. We are, in fact, working on developing uh, India-specific uh, case, test cases, which can sit on the development platforms, uh, especially in uh, very complex traffic situations, uh, very complex and non-standardized road infrastructure. Uh, so such cases are getting developed in India, maybe of use to the developers at the global platform. So uh, with that, I think uh, it's time to close uh, this session. Thank you very much to both the uh, presenters for a very wonderful presentation. I hand it over to the organizers. Thank you to the chairperson and the speakers. May I request the chairperson, Mrs. Rashmi, to hand over the memento to our speakers, Professor Helmut Hollis, Chairman and CEO, AVL Austria. Thank you, sir, for joining us at FISITA 2018 first plenary session. also request you to hand over the memento to Professor Klaus Kompas, Vice President, Vehicle Safety BMW Group. And may I request Dr. R. Mahadevan, our past president of SAE India, to hand over the memento to our the chairperson of this session, Mrs. Rashmi Udvashri, Director ARAI.
Thank you, sir. So we'll conclude this session formally, and please join us for the lunch just behind this session. Thank you very much.